last base of the daily news, a champion of, or, of the ordinary citizens as the Pulitzer jury, jury finally realized. We have come, we have some wonderful writers here tonight and they all with a very good common touch. But many of the new generation reporters coming aboard in the 1970s and 1980s were not so well endowed. All highly educated, all very professional, but they didn't live in Red Hook or Hunts Point. They didn't want to settle in East New York or be assigned to Harlem. Just as vast wealth, wealth and poverty exist side by side but seldom touch, they lived apart from many of the most vi vibrant communities in the city. Millions of lives were left in, unwatched in one, unwatched warrens, only attracting headlines at the intersections of violence and crime. The disconnect between newspapers and ordinary people was one of the bad omens for our industry. And it underlined as perhaps nothing else could, the priceless value of Jimmy Breslin, who gave up, grew up in Queens on the ground floor of the city with a mother who was working for the welfare department and had an intense hatred of unfairness. He was a guy who walked the streets and talked and listen to the voices, as Pete Hamill has said so often, voices of angst and anguish, poor people, black, white, and Hispanic, young lives rotting away amid the splendors of New York. Yet just, the, just as Irish immigrants did in an earlier age, it's been a privilege to know and to work with this fellow a caring human being, marvelously talented, master of irony and humor, and a great newspaper man who routinely called his editors in the middle of the night to complain about a bungled headline or a, or a missed story. This is awful, he'd shout. You've got to do something. Well, he was right. We did, or we tried to. Congratulations on your 60 years, Jim. Uh, Jimmy was one of the um, people in the newspaper business long ago who understood how important it was to have women in the room. First of all, it improved the level of language in the city room um, for a while. Uh, but he particularly loved certain people. He loved the following speaker because when she worked at the Daily News, she once chased a thief down 42nd Street, giving him a good whack in the head, had him arrested, and went back to the paper to work. That was his idea of a newspaper woman. Uh, she has since then edit, been managing editor of The Observer and is now a major editor at the New York Times helping bring it into the strange new world of the internet with coverage of hyper-local issues and so on. Uh, a wonderful newspaper person and a terrific human being. Please welcome Mary Ann Giordano. Very happy to be here to uh, pay allegiance to my friend Jimmy Breslin. Um, some of you might be asking yourself, so what is that Italian woman doing up there with all these Irish men? <laughs> and I would have to say that's a question I've been asking myself for about 30 years now. <laughs> uh, 
But I'm honored to be included here as I've been honored all these years to work beside so many of these writers, men and women, um, especially given that unfortunately people of my persuasion have been more inclined to make tabloid news than to report and write it. <laughs> Uh, like many of you here tonight, I was inspired and goaded and shamed by Jimmy Breslin just about from the moment I decided to put my fingers to the keyboard and tell stories about New York. I went straight from college to the library where I checked out a collection of Jimmy's works. Everything I really to kn needed to know to be a reporter was right there. Like a lot of you, I often ask myself through the years, how would Breslin cover it? And as an editor, I have sent more than one reporter out with instructions to think like Breslin, find the untold angle, the little guy who unwittingly was drawn into some bit of breaking or developing news, the detail that will never come out at a press conference or just by a telephone interview. Or as Jimmy would say, just do the work. But inspiration is one thing, friendship another, and I'm proud to say that Jimmy is my friend. Now, I've heard all the stories about the old days, the drinking, the growling, the carelessness. They make for great stories. But when I was a baby reporter, in awe of all the big guns at the Daily News, Jimmy took me for coffee on the Lower East Side, and he treated me like I actually belonged there. When I came home from the hospital with my first baby, there was that unforgettable voice on our answering machine acknowledging this momentum occasion in our lives and wishing us luck. And for the last few years, I have, an op uh, I have an open invitation to bring my middle son, who is interested in politics, over to see Jimmy and Ronnie to pick their brains and learn from the pros. The first time I told Jimmy that I had a kid interested, maybe, in running for office, he jumped all over me. There is only one way to prepare for a career in politics, he told me. You have to wake him up every morning and insult him. <laughs> Let him get used to it now. <laughs> now, where else can you get that kind of advice? <laughs> Jimmy, I just want to thank you for reminding me over and over why I'm in this business and to thank you for being my friend. And you know, I always suspected you had a soft spot for Italians with some form of Mary in their names. And I'm happy to be a beneficiary. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the lessons of, of Breslin, as Marianne says, are passed to so many people, um, directly or indirectly. Uh, but the next speaker is somebody who absorbed the lessons and yet did it his way. Uh, he's one of the most thorough reporters on New York right up to this day. He's been doing it for many, many years, always at the Daily News. He's remained friends with Mr. Breslin for 30 years, or 25. Um, please welcome Michael Daly. Well, I started out the day at uh, East 233rd Street and Furman Avenue in the Bronx today looking at uh, the blood left by a lady who was shot in the head as she was loading her kids into school, and I thought, thanks, JB. And about 10 minutes later, I spoke to a woman who had dashed out barefoot in her nightgown and swept up both kids in her arms, and she was magnificent. And I thought, thank you, JB. I get choked up just talking about this guy. <laughs> Many Thanksgivings ago, um, the dailies and the Breslin's go almost far back. I ended up at the Breslin house at Thanksgiving, and uh, Rosemary Breslin, the elder, had set out a table that was magnificent that made you think how much better off the Mayflower would have been if they had Sicilians aboard. <laughs> and, and then, uh, down came the great man, and I think he was wearing pajamas, but he might have just been sleeping in his clothes. <laughs> I have a very clear memory of him taking the drumstick. He then returned upstairs, 
and later on I went up and there he was asleep on the bed with the gnarled bone on his chest. <laughs> I asked him about that recently and he said something that's actually true about being JB number one. He said, it's tiring. <laughs> and another moment that comes up to mind is when we were both found ourselves covering uh, Princess Diana's funeral. And on the way back, the only seats we could get were British Airways business class, uh, which is not what we would have necessarily chosen. And uh, I sat down next to JB, and he put on a pair of headphones, and of course spoke over the headphones. <laughs> and he's sitting there, and uh, this lady serves a guy down the aisle his meal. How come I don't eat? And the lady very politely said, uh, well, sir, this is a special order. This man's a vegetarian. Um, how come I don't eat? And she said, well, sir, are you a vegetarian? Do I look like a freaking vegetarian? We now have the complete attention of business class of British Airways. Whereupon Jimmy sits back and ponders the days that have passed and he says, what did that blonde ever do for anybody anyway? I don't want to think what they did to our food before they brought it to us. But it, at the moment I think uh, that comes to mind about Jimmy always when it comes to this business is I was off writing a novel and when the Crown Heights riots came and I looked on the television and I saw a burning yellow taxi. And I said to myself, there's only one guy on earth who first of all would think of taking a yellow cab to a riot and second of all could get the guy to go there. And sure enough, JB. And uh, he had a very scary moment with that cab. I mean, that was, no, that was no joke. And the thing about JB is he went right to work and it did not change one bit the way he wrote about the people of this city who he feels weren't being treated fairly. He stayed true to himself, and uh, there are not many people who could do that. Um, and so I learned from that, you gotta go out on the story. <laughs> because if you can take a yellow cab to a riot, there's no excuse not to go cover it. Um, another thing I learned, uh, was how precise he is with language. Um, shortly before he had his brain operation, the night before, I came by and Ronnie said, Jimmy, Michael's come to say hello. And from the back I hear, he came to say goodbye. <laughs> Thank God it went okay. And I think we should all be grateful that Jimmy's brain remembered him and us. And the final thing I'll say is uh, Jimmy's had hardships to equal those of a lot of the people he writes about. And, you know, so you worry about them sometimes. And the other day I said, uh, JB, how you doing? Big. Said, well, I'm glad to hear that. And there's some constants in the universe. You know, you're big. Saturn's big. Who's big? <laughs> Saturn, the planet. Fuck Saturn. <laughs> but, you know, JB, I think you're right. Because if they had a night if we announced a night, uh, a tribute to Saturn, there'd be about three guys here with double glasses. <laughs> so in the universe that is the city of New York, JB, you're bigger than Saturn. That's the first time I ever heard Saturn mentioned in a tribute to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> the next speaker um, is somebody that uh, all each of us would like to have as a lawyer if we got in really serious trouble. And I always think that if Jimmy had gone to law school instead of the Long Island Press, he would have been a lawyer just like this fellow. Please welcome Steve Murphy. You know, when I used to read Jimmy's 
articles and that, it always had a resonance of taking you through the spectrum of all our human emotions. But you know what? As I listen to everyone here, there's one word that everyone seems to hit, and that's heavyweight. And I'm going to tell you a quick story of how I suffered because I was close to that heavyweight. Jimmy was doing an article on the mafia cops trial. And I was in federal court, and I met Dennis Hamill there. So he says to me, when you finish with what you're doing, why don't you come down? So I came down, and I sat next to him. And Jimmy was like six rows in front of us. And Jack Weinstein was the judge. And there were marshals all over the place. And from six rows in front of me, when the main witness was on the stand, and he was, he was definitely a hard witness, and the defense attorney was getting nowhere with him. And for the first time, I realized that Jimmy has the same high-pitched voice that I do. <laughs> and I hear him turning around, and as he called me, Stevie, Stevie, they, they stink, they're getting nowhere here. And the judge is looking, and the marshals are coming around, and he keeps turning around, David, David. Now, I ain't saying a word. I ain't saying a word. I'm sitting there, and, I, and I'm trying to get smaller than I am. All right? Now, here's the, here's the irony of the whole thing. I, I've been asked by many judges to leave, but Never because what somebody else is doing, all right? I have the marshal come over to me, and he tells me, come here, come here. So I get up, I walk over to him, and he says to me, uh, listen, you're going to have to leave. And I said, why? So he says to me, because I know you're crazy enough that eventually you'll start talking to him from six roads away. So I said, in other words, I'm being thrown out because I might do something and he's going to stay here? So he said, well, he's Jimmy Breslin. <laughs> and I realized at that point that here I am and I'm in, you know, the aura of, the Bre of Jimmy Breslin. So as I leave, Dennis Hamill, being the ball breaker he is, comes out and says to me, you got thrown out because of what Breslin was saying? He says, I said, the guy told me I was crazy enough to carry on the conversation with him. But to wrap it up, since I was told I only have three minutes, all right? Uh, what I do want to say is that I grew up reading about Fat Thomas the Bookmaker, Klein the Lawyer, and I avoided Breslin because I didn't want him to think anyone think I was Klein the Lawyer. <laughs> but I think we all owe Jimmy Breslin a debt of gratitude because you know what? He's been a great defender of the First Amendment and one of the great New Yorkers and a great journalist. Thank you. <laughs> One thing about Breslin in a city room was that he didn't just talk to the big shots. He knew that he would probably get better stories from the people that don't um, stand front and center every time the, uh, the paper comes out, but who are essential to its coming out. Among those people uh, is a woman who has been the strong right hand or right arm of the, uh, the Daily News Sports Department for more than 30 years. Please welcome Dolores Thompson. Oh my God. That was a tough act to follow. <laughs> 
I know Jimmy because um, I work in the Daily News Sports Department and I pick up the phone. So Mike and I decided that uh, because he gets so many crazy calls sometimes, that we would not give out any information until Jimmy or anybody would, uh, you know, give their name. So Jimmy calls, and he says, I want to speak to Mike Lupica. And I say, 